chapter 11 of Little Busybodies, The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees and Other Busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sash Elliott. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter 11 Camping Out At last the day, expected all summer long, had come. The children, Hope and Betty, Jack, Peter and Jimmy, Mrs. Reese and Ben Gile, were gathered on the edge of the pond, their packs in the canoes, their paddles at bow and stern. Other guides had taken the food and tents ahead the day before. Their friends had gathered to bid them goodbye, and finally, amid the farewells, they were off. Jimmy in a canoe by himself, Jack and Peter paddling Mrs. Reese, and Ben Gile with the two little girls. Everybody was so excited that all talked at once, and nobody could hear anyone else. Hope and Betty had never been camping before, and the boys meant to show the girls all the wonders of sleeping and eating out in the woods. Finally, they came to a carry, that is, a path leading from one lake to another, across which the food and canoes have to be lugged. The girls and Mrs. Reese carried the packs and food over, making several trips in order to do so, and the boys and the guide, crossing their paddles under the thwarts of the canoes and raising the blades on their shoulders, balanced the canoes and trotted swiftly over the carry. Nothing seemed any trouble that glorious, beautiful day. Nothing too heavy, nothing too hard. Betty and Hope could have skipped over every inch of the trail, and they were quite sure that they could have done all the paddling too. And Betty did learn, in after years, not only to paddle, but also to carry her own canoe, for she grew to be a big, strong, athletic girl, with rosy cheeks and a quick, sure step. Hour after hour they went from one pond to another. The ponds were larger and wilder at each crossing, and already they were in a wilderness of woods and lakes, and heard the whistle of the hawk, the scream of the lonely eagle, and the crazy cries of the loon. Every once in a while a big heron mounted lazily upward and flew off solemnly to a place where his peace need not be disturbed. Although Hope and Peter and Jack lived all the year round in Rangeley Village, yet they had never been so far away from home before, and to them it seemed very wonderful. Even in the midst of it all, however, Jack did not forget the prize Ben Gile had offered. He hurried over carry after carry, and at the end of each one might be found flat on his face studying some little hill of ants. At last, after travelling five hours, they came to a halt, ravenously hungry. Dinner was cooked and eaten, and then after dinner they began their long ascent of saddleback, for they were going to a lonely little pond on the second highest mountain in the state of Maine. There, at Camp in the Clouds, was a cabin in which Mrs. Reese could sleep, and the girls too, if they wished, although they declared that they would not. Up, up the hill they trudged, stepping over blowdowns, following their footing carefully, and watching with interest the little animals that scampered out of their way. But never did packs grow so heavy, and at last Mrs. Reese, who was carrying nothing but Jack's camera, sat down panting and laughing. I can't go a step farther, she declared, until I catch my breath. This is a good place to rest, assented the guide. Some deer found it so this morning, I think. Here, catch that butterfly, Jack. In a flash, Jack had caught the butterfly, and brought it gently to Ben Gile. You don't see this fellow up here often. Who knows the difference between a butterfly and a moth? No one? Well, that is because most children are going to bed about the time the moth begins to fly. Doesn't anyone know? 
You have all seen moths and butterflies. Well, well, well. The first thing you see is that when the moth lights on the edge of a flower cup, instead of holding the wings up above the body, as the butterfly does, it spreads its wings flat over the body. Then a butterfly has little knobs at the tips of its slender antennae, while the moth has slender ones without knobs, or pretty, feathery ones that look like plumes. I supposed, said Peter, that moths and butterflies were just the same, except that moths will fly into the house and burn their wings on the lamps. Peter didn't in the least care about moths and butterflies. He was longing to get to the top of the mountain, but he was too polite to seem impatient. They are alike in many ways. You remember, do you not, that the locust has a pair of soft jaws covering over the dark, hard ones? In the moths and butterflies, these jaws are different. Each one is long and has a deep groove on the inner side. These two grooves fit together and make a slender tube called a proboscis. When flying, this long tube is rolled up in a tight coil under the head. Alighting, the proboscis is quickly uncoiled and dipped into the throat of the flower, and the sweet nectar sipped from it. See here, Jack, what have you on your fingers? The dust from the butterfly's wing, sir. No, not quite dust or powder either. That dust is tiny hair and scales. If I had a powerful lens in my pocket, I could show you how deeply some of these tiny scales are scalloped so that they look like a hand with fingers. If you rubbed all the scales off that wing, there would be no colour left, for the scales are like little sacks and many of them contain grains of colour called pigment, red, yellow or brown. You have all seen the rainbow of colours on a soap bubble? Well, the brilliant colours of the wing are made in just the same way as the colours on a bubble, by the light striking the little ridges on the overlapping scales. It is not only we who are fearfully and wonderfully made, said Mrs. Reese, but even the tiniest creatures God has created, and all with a purpose, all with a place. The guide nodded his head. The more you study, the more you see how every least thing is part of a great mysterious whole. If you look at a butterfly's wing from which the scales have been rubbed, you will see plan and purpose in the placing of even those scales, for the little pits into which the stems of the scale fit are turned all one way, towards the base of the wing. They are so beautiful! exclaimed Betty. Are they always pretty? That depends, replied the old man. Were they in their caterpillar youth, you can think them pretty? They have a bad name, then, for being homely, and do a good deal of damage. Oh, I hate caterpillars, cried Hope. Fuzzy caterpillars hump so and crawl, said Betty. You mean woolly bears? Woolly bears, exclaimed the children. Yes, not teddy bears. They have to play somehow, so they wiggle for joy, and this takes them along very fast. That is, fast for a caterpillar. Sometimes they spin a long thread by which they take a flying shortcut and land on your back. Jimmy dropped a tiny twig down Betty's back, which made her scream. But they don't harm us, said Ben Gile. They are so fussy about what they eat for dinner that they wouldn't think of biting even the sweetest little boy or girl. They prefer something far more tender. Ah, you wouldn't like Isabella? The old man shook his head sadly. Isabella? Who is Isabella? questioned the children. Isabella is always in a hurry, said the guide. Always. She is brown in the middle and black on the head and tail end, Isabella is, and she walks rapidly, as if she had a great deal to do before she could take time to be made over into a tiger moth. She stops every once in a while to make sure she is on the right road. Then she hurries along in a nervous, fidgety way, 
looking for a nice comfortable stone under which to have a winter home for isabella is in such haste that she could never think of taking time to spin a cocoon but do all caterpillars turn into moths or butterflies asked jack yes every one my son that lives long enough just as surely as a boy will turn into a man the butterfly lays the egg and after the egg has been quiet for a while out comes a little worm the worm spins the cocoon and out of the cocoon comes a perfect moth or butterfly it is a wonderful cycle a wonderful series of changes little boys and girls seem to be surrounded with more love and don't change their skins as moths do but the mystery of life belongs quite as much to the helpless moth as it does to any one of us but is a caterpillar an insect and is a butterfly an insect asked betty of course you goose said jimmy you don't expect to hatch a duck from a hen's egg do you but ben gile who was older than jimmy and decidedly more patient explained carefully if you look at a caterpillar and a moth you will see that their bodies aren't so unlike after all they are made up of rings and both the moth and the caterpillar have six legs apiece most caterpillars have little prop legs but these aren't real legs and shouldn't be counted caterpillars eat and eat and eat they are such solid little chaps they must need a good many legs real and false to keep moving at all well hey oh stretch your own legs boys we'll leave the caterpillar where it is and move on to the top of the mountain or we'll never be there in time to eat our own supper one two three march and off they went talking and laughing and scrambling up the side of the mountain which swung dark and steep above them End of chapter 11「Twelve of Little Busybodies – The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees and Other Busybodies – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sash Elliott Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks Chapter 12 camp in the clouds the camp was reached once there the children found the other two guides in the cabin the cook tent was already pitched the sleeping tents had been left so that the boys might choose their own locations and help in pitching them it was a beautiful place remote wild two-thirds up the side of the great mountain in front was the famous trout pond and beyond the little valley made by the pond the crest of the mountain rose higher and higher dusk was coming on and the crisp mountain air was filled with the shadows of the woods along the mountain summit lay streamers of white cloud down 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 reached the long fingers of cloud and up 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 reached the deep shadows just as if a great hand were closing the world in dusk every little sound was as clear in the evening air as the water of the pond was transparent small shadows moved about the edge of the pond deer they were said ben Gile, that had come down to the edge to drink phew isn't it cold shouted the children as they ran from one thing to another and won't supper taste good jack who hadn't on any stout boots like jimmy's and whose jacket was threadbare and thin began to think the sleeping blankets would feel good when it was time to crawl in in front of the cabin blazed a big campfire and around this fire supper was served did stewed apricots soda biscuits bacon eggs hot cakes ever taste so good will they ever taste so good again did hot cakes and syrup ever make the butterfly so fast asked ben Gile. and speaking of the butterfly he went on it's not time to turn in yet 
It's too dark to fish or explore, so let me tell you a little more about the butterfly. And if you don't like it, you can just imagine it is a hot cake butterfly. The children thought this was a great joke. But Peter, who had eaten so much he was almost asleep, didn't hear what Ben Gile said. Well, the old man continued, just as if he were beginning where he had left off in the afternoon, well, the caterpillar eats so much, it eats almost as much as Peter does. At this, Peter opened his eyes good-naturedly. It eats so much that very soon it grows too big for its skin, so the old skin splits for the growing body, and out comes a young caterpillar in a clean new dress, a very easy way for Mrs. Butterfly to have her babies get new clothes. Don't you think it is, Mrs. Reese? No hems to stitch, no buttons to sew on, no darning. The only things their mothers ever do for them is to start them with the food they like. And such a butterfly this mother is that little she cares whether her children are considered pests or not, because they eat everything green that they like and eat before they are invited. A long sigh of relief the gardener or farmer draws when the caterpillars lie quiet to pupate. They lie very, very quiet, with wings, antennae, and legs folded under the body. What does pupate mean? asked Betty, who was poking the fire and listening hard to every word the old man spoke. It means just that, to lie quiet and change. They do it in different ways. Some crawl down into the ground, and some pull out their silky hairs. And with these, and the silk they can spin, they make a soft silken cocoon. Some make over their last skin into a hard covering. The monarch butterfly does this. And there is a troublesome creature called the clothes moth. Mrs. Reese can tell you about that, who lays its eggs on anything woolen it can find. After a while, a baby clothes moth, a whitish worm, hatches out. Then this little fellow eats the fibres of the wool and finally spins a cocoon out of these fibres and its own silk. Some caterpillars are leaf rollers. That is, when they pupate, they roll over the corners of a leaf, make themselves a neat hammock, and there lie quite still in a cool and comfortable place to sleep. Poor Peter had tumbled over, his head on Mrs. Reese's lap. Betty and Hope, wide awake, were thinking just as much of the wonderful tent in which they were to sleep as of the butterflies and moths. They were wide awake enough to point their fingers at sleepy Peter. I think there is one kind of moth, said Mrs. Reese, stroking Peter's silky hair, that spins something almost as soft as this. Softer affirmed Ben Gile, and that is the silkworm. Does the caterpillar make the silk our dresses are made from? asked Betty. Yes, indeed. The mother moth is a creamy white. She lays several hundred eggs. From each of these eggs comes a little worm. These little worms have been cared for so long by men that they don't know how to take care of themselves any more. They like to eat the leaves of the mulberry tree. If these leaves are not to be found, they will sometimes eat lettuce. For 45 days, they eat as fast as they can, which is a good deal faster than greedy children can eat. Every 10 days or so, they cast aside their old skin and come out in a new one. After the last molting of the skin, the worm begins to spin a cocoon about itself. At first, the cocoon is not very smooth, but in a while, the worm gets well started and spins the rest of it with one long, silky thread. Isn't that wonderful? exclaimed one of the guides. I suppose that silk is finer than the finest trout line. A hundred times finer, answered Ben. Usually, it is three hundred yards long. Before the pupa has a chance to make its way out, and so destroy the long silken thread, the man who has taken such care of the worm drops the cocoon into boiling water, which kills the pupa at once. Then the precious silk thread is carefully unwound onto little spools and is ready to be made into thread 
or spun into silk. And now, children, it's time for you to spin your dreams. Shake up Peter, and we'll get ready for the night. Too bad to leave this fire, but we can have one as often as we want. The boys slept like tops, but there were two little girls who lay rather wide awake most of the night, listening to the strangest grunting sounds in the world. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Little Busybodies: The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busybodies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter Thirteen Stormbound about beetles after two glorious days of exploring exploricating the guides called it the children went to bed early expecting to make an early start to hunt partridge they were so tired from their good times that for two or three hours they slept like tops but in front of the cabin ben guile and mrs reese and the other guides were looking at the night sky anxiously the lightning flashed more and more vividly black clouds were coming nearer and nearer what was a distant rumble soon became a nearby long undertow of ominous sound nearer and nearer it came until every flash was followed by a sound like ripping mrs reese was very uneasy for she did not like to have the children in the tents alone but soon betty and hope came scampering through the dark to the cabin they were surprised to see the older people up before long the boys also came to the cabin rubbing their eyes yawning and pretending not to care whether there was to be a cyclone or a cloudburst for a while all sat waiting for the storm to break when it did break what torrents of rain and wind descended how the trees groaned and cracked how the rain roared up the shingled roof and how the wind howled through the mountain valley well said ben guile let's have a fire in the fireplace then we can have a crackle of our own he had noticed how nervous mrs reese grew and that the little girls were watching her he could not help thinking that it was foolish even wicked to waste strength in fear of something which no one of them could stop build a fire boys and build a fire they did a royal good blaze now throw on some of those pine cones you children gathered there was a flare in the cabin almost as bright as the incessant flare of the lightning outside i'll tell you what we'll do he continued we'll have a midnight spread we'll have some of tom's famous flapjacks mrs reese don't you want to make molasses candy and then the children can pull it the storm was forgotten by the children as with many squeals of glee they rushed into this midnight frolic and now ben said tom the guide i've just found something i have it in my hand i propose ben while the rest of us work that you make one of your stories out of it and tell us all about it tom opened his hand and the children crowded around to see there was a shout of laughter why that's only a dead june bug who wants to know about a june bug exclaimed jimmy much to the discomfiture of the guide who knew a great deal about moose and deer and bears and beavers even if he didn't know much about a june bug the guides had profound respect for the schoolmaster ben guile who was really too wise and kind to laugh at another's ignorance but this is another story and jimmy learned better in the years to come you're right tom said ben to want to know sometimes it's about these commonest things folks know the least when i was a boy it was always so with me there are several facts about a june bug that are interesting first it's not a june bug at all and second it comes in may and not in june it is really a may beetle and a great clumsy buzzing blundering fellow it is as careless about its appearance as it is about the way it enters a room you know the old adage haste makes waste perhaps it's the haste that makes the june bugs untidiness beetles have hard wing covers see these little shell-like casings to cover the more delicate wings underneath 
the june bug has wing covers too but it never keeps its best wings tucked in they are always hanging out in a crumpled way these bugs eat the leaves of the trees and their children little fat white grubs with horny heads nibble as they crawl around under the surface of the earth the tender roots of the grass and the strawberry plants why ben you've told me more already said tom than any dullard like me could ever learn from a book to think it's a beetle but i might have known from looking at it are all the beetles harmful most of them are pests and do a good deal of damage its cousin rose beetle is pretty her body covered with soft yellow hairs and she has rose-colored legs but handsome is as handsome does and rose beetle causes more damage than her clumsy cousin for rose feeds on rose bushes as well as on fruit trees indeed almost everything that comes to her mill is grist she's as bad and worse than the elm beetle by this time the cooking molasses smelled so good the cabin fire roared so pleasantly and the smell of the flapjacks adam was frying was so appetizing that the children had quite forgotten the storm outside and were having one of the jolliest frolics of their lives one they never forgot tell us something more sir urged jack about the beetles there is one comical fellow who makes me think of peter in the books it is called the click beetle but it is also called a skipjack because of the somersaults it can turn on the underside of its thorax is a spine resting on the edge of a hole this funny beetle by pushing the spine down over the hole and then letting it go throws itself up in the air with a sharp click oh i know them called hope for i have seen them doing it but i never knew how they did it and now said master all wise very soberly after i tell you that the children of the click beetle are called wireworms and that they eat and kill the roots of plants i want to tell you about a beetle no one of you has ever heard of a most extraordinary beetle all were attention at once many years ago there lived away out in california a little round brownish striped beetle which crawled about and ate heartily of a plant called the sand burr one day one of the family happened to wander up to a nice juicy potato plant after eating its fill it probably looked up some of its brothers and sisters and told them about these good plants growing in the fields with one accord they left the sand burrs and began to eat the potato plant farther and farther they wandered until thousands of them reached the eastern part of the country eating the potato plants wherever they found them on the way now these beetles are to be seen everywhere in our country spoiling crop after crop by this time jack's eager face was smiling and he looked questioningly at ben guile what kind of a beetle do you suppose it was asked the old man nobody knew at last jack ventured was it a potato bug sir yes oh of course shouted the children why didn't we think of that but you said we had never seen it so i did said the guide and i don't believe there is one child here who has ever carefully watched the potato bug and there's the carpet beetle whose babies eat carpets unless your mother tempts them with a piece of red flannel and there's the searcher beetle with its pretty green or violet wing covers who is always on the search for caterpillars and there's the firefly which is a soft-bodied beetle and there's the very useful little beetle we call the ladybug which is not a bug but a beetle the ladybug is a great help to men who own fruit orchards in the west all over the country are to be found little bugs called scale insects these scales are very bad for trees because with their long slender beaks the scales pump out the sap sometimes they are so thick on the branch that they coat it entirely you remember that i told you that one of these troublesome scales is the cottony cushion scale and that one day it was discovered that a lady beetle from australia liked these scales very much so a great many of them were taken to california to eat the scales the ladybugs eat little green aphids too and often mrs ladybug will lay her eggs right in the midst of a family of aphids and then the larvae are surrounded by a hearty lunch when they come out of the egg 
they eat the aphids the scales and sometimes the eggs of other insects time ben said adam to have the flapjacks i guess the storm must be blowing over all drew up to the cabin table and ate as heartily as if they were eating dinner it really looked as if the children had had no supper in about half an hour said tom the storm will be over aren't there any beetles that live in the water ben oh yes you can see them any day if you go by a brook the diving beetles are skimming about rowing themselves along with their flattened hind legs every few minutes they come to the surface and lift their wings to get a little air under them then down they go into the brook they are very hungry beetles eating other insects which they find in the water the boldest often try to take a bite out of a fish just think of calling a baby beetle a water tiger well these babies are as savage and ferocious to the little creatures living about them in the water as a big tiger would be to us if we should happen to meet one i like best the whirligig beetles they are such frisky fellows always having a good time frolicking about with dozens of other little whirligigs they are bluish black and shiny and if you look carefully you will see a little bubble at the tip of every tail this little bubble is held there by tiny hairs and because whirligig has it it can breathe while it stays under water from time to time it comes to the surface to get a new bubble then it is off again for another race or game of tag with its friends and at the same time to snap up a few water creatures for dinner it looks as though it has four eyes but it has not just two divided into upper and lower halves the upper halves look up through the water and the lower ones down at the bottom of the brooks so you see insects must step lively if they want to keep out of its clutches the babies of some beetles instead of liking nice clean food prefer dead animals the mother and father hunt around until they find a dead mouse or bird then they begin to dig away the earth under the mouse or bird and around it finally the poor dead thing is in a deep hole then mrs burying beetle lays her eggs on it and together they cover it up with earth when the grubs hatch they find plenty to eat and are soon big burying beetles like their mothers and fathers did you ever wonder how the little fat worms get inside of chestnuts and acorns a beetle called a weevil is the creature which puts the fat worms there mrs weevil has a long slender curved beak she crawls up onto the side of a chestnut bores a hole in the side then lays an egg deep down in it after a while the egg hatches and the tiny grub begins to feed on the nut fatter and fatter it gets sometimes it lies in the nut all winter but more often it crawls out and buries itself in the ground while it grows into a weevil some days as you are walking along a sunny road in the country you may meet a blister beetle it is a pretty bluish green color and when you pick it up you will see drops of oil oozing out of its joints the dried bodies will raise a blister on your skin and that is the reason we call such beetles blister beetles there is a queer blister beetle who lays her eggs near bees nests the baby beetles then wait for a bee to come along they fasten themselves to the hairs on the bee's body when the bee goes into its nest to put in the honey the young beetle manages to get into the honey cell with the egg mrs bee does not see that anything is amiss seals up the cell and flies away for another load the larva first eats the egg of mrs bee then it changes into a clumsy kind of a fellow floats in the honey and eats all it can so that it will quickly become a grown-up there is one beetle which plants a tiny fungus in its home in the ground the babies run along and eat the tips of this delicacy while the mothers and fathers take larger bites these are called ambrosia beetles because of the dainty food they eat now that the storm is over i mustn't tell you anything more than a few words about the engraver beetle which lives between the bark and the live wood of a tree mr and mrs engraver beetle make a long tunnel under the bark mrs engraver makes notches along the sides and in every notch lays an egg when the babies hatch each one begins a tunnel for itself running out straight from the long one and now that's the end of this story well ben said tom respectfully these children don't know the value of the things they are learning it's a privilege sir to have a chance to guide with you 
i've learned more in these last years about god's wonders from you than ever i learned in all my long life i didn't know there were so many beetles in the world oh, these are only half a dozen of the multitude of beetles which we haven't the time to name now off to bed children said mrs reese or you'll never be able to get up early good night to everyone End of chapter 13、Chapter、Fourteen Chapter Fourteen of Little Busy Bodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees, and Other Busy Bodies. This is a LibriVault recording. All LibriVault recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVault.org. Recording by Sarosha Thawansun Surakun from Bangkok, Thailand. Little Busy Bodies by Janet Augustus Marks, Chapter Fourteen. A Day's Hunting. It was a glorious day after the night storm. By five o'clock, the children were ready to go hunting with Benjo. Although they were rather sleepy, yet they managed to get an early breakfast. Five o'clock. Is an early breakfast, isn't it? And by six o'clock, they were off into the woods. Benjamin made the children follow behind him in single file and so in line, making as little noise as possible. They went through the woods, the birch trees and poplars. In the midst of the darker, heavier foliage, seemed golden with the early sunlight. Everywhere the bushes sparkled with the rain of the night before. They took a path that ran almost in a curve around one entire side of the mountain. Benjamin kept a sharp lookout for the partridge. He knew it would be upon the ground or up in the trees. He pointed to several places where partridge had been scratching. The woods were full of them, and every minute he expected to hear the whirr of their wings as they started up. And sure enough, there was suddenly a loud beating of wings, and then crack, crack, crack. From the shotgun, down came three plump partridges. Not more than ten minutes later, the old man brought down three more. Then he let Jack, who was a good shot, take his gun, and down came two more. Eight partridges! He exclaimed, and quite enough for us all. We shoot only what we actually need for food, not a bird more. Oh ho! Somebody else made a home there. Old Paul Bear had been tearing it out and licking his chops. The children leaned forward, looking eagerly. "What was it?" they asked. "Honey," said the guide. "Paul Bear has a sweet tooth for honey and berries." "I should think the bee would sting him," said Jimmy. "They do try to, but little he cares. With his thick coat of hair, not a bit. The bees have another enemy too." Which is always hovering about to find the chance to get into the bee's little house. That is the bee moth. If she gets the least opportunity, mother bee's moth lays her eggs in the wax of the honeycomb for the baby moths, and are very fond of wax. It's not an easy matter to get in when the bees are not looking, but she manages it quite often. And when the little larvas hatch out of the eggs. They eat the wax, and the mischief is done. When Mother Bee Moth is seen, the bees rush upon her and sting her to death. They have good cause to hate her, for the wax is precious, hard to make, and to mold into the little cells. It is not pleasant to have some miserable worm eat the roof from your head. Oftentimes, the bees are so discouraged that they decide, as they talk it over in bee language. That it is easier to build a new home than to repair the old one. They set out upon an hour of departure, and off they go. But I didn't know," said Betty, "that bees live in their hives. I thought that they just stored their honey there." So did I," said Jimmy. It was Jack time to smile for a country boy. He had often watched the hives. Couldn't you tell us something, sir? Here's a bit of the corn left. Do you want to hear? Oh, I think bees are so interesting. Betty clapped her hand. Did you ever look closely at a bee? Their bodies are covered with hairs, unlike the hairs found on other insects. For each hair is a tiny plum, and their mouths, 
which they have to use for so many different things are remarkably made each part is formed to do a certain kind of work first there are the strong biting jaws then another pair of jaws joined to the lower lip which move easily back and forth this forms a sucking instrument which the bees use for drinking nectar my exclaimed peter it must be convenient to have two pairs of jaws on the head too are antennae which form little elbows like those of the ant with these the bee smells and feels some bees have short tongues and usually live alone others have long tongues and generally live in colonies perhaps a long tongue makes an insect sociable and perhaps sociability makes a tongue grow long the children were looking at their tongues to see which had the longest peter scanned his anxiously your tongue is awfully long pete said jack i know an interesting short-tongued bee who lives in a house by herself her name is adriana she bore a hole in the ground digging out a wide hallway from these she digs side passages each one ending in a little closed room the wall of these rooms are hard and shiny like porcelain when adrenaline finishes her house she makes a nourishing place of nectar and pollen pollen is the yellow powder from flowers you know bees by carrying about the pollen help in fertilizing the flowers but of these we shall learn more some day when we are talking about flowers this powder the bees packs down into the little rooms then she lays an egg on each pile of food and builds a door to shut the egg away safely do bees always feed their children on nectar and pollen asked hope always replied the old man they never feed their babies on other insects as the ants and wasps do then there are the little short-tongued bees who live in apartments the apartments all clustered together with a common wide passageway into the ground and separate hallways around the main opening is an old chimney built on a slant which prevents the rain from pouring into the open doorway the children were wide eyed with astonishment that bees should build chimneys was more than they could believe goodness said jimmy if that is what a short-tongued bee can do what can a long-tongued bee do they are very clever some are carpenters some masons some miners some tailors the leaf-cutter bee makes a neat home covering the walls with pretty green leaves first she digs a tunnel in a suitable branch of wood then she goes to a rose bush cuts out an oval piece of a rose leaf and arranges it smoothly on the wall of the tunnel cuts out the oval pieces and put them on fastening the edges neatly together then the bottom of the tunnel she puts some pollen paste lay an eggs on the paste cut some circular pieces of rose leaf which she presses on the top of the eggs and pollen forming a green roof for the room and a floor for the room above she puts in more food and another egg until the tunnel is full of little rooms and what does the carpenter bee do asked jack looking with the nearest speck at the bit of honeycomb he held in his hand she makes store of pith and like the tender mother she is sits on top of the nest waiting for her baby to grow up this is the most unusual thing for a bee mother to do the egg at the very bottom of the tube hatches first but it has to wait until the other hatch by and by mrs carpenter bee takes them all out for a sunny flight in the summer air and they never come back any more sang out peter indeed they do you carefree youngster the pit doors have been taken down and they come back to put things in order they clean house they bring out every scrap piece by piece there is a big carpenter's bee that makes its door of ships of wood usually neatly glued together there is just one lazy bee in the world of which i know and that is a visiting bee visiting bee yes the guest bees who visit their friends the year round 
let their hosts wait upon them and never help to keep anything clean or to collect nectar and pollen mrs case b even lays her eggs in mrs bumblebee's nest and when the guest baby hatch out it is not their mother but mrs bumblebee who feeds them from the food she has stored up for her own children the guest bees are so lazy that no little baskets are found on their eggs for carrying pollen but i'm to be ever idle asked peter whose conscience hurt him because he never liked to work no be except the guest bee are drawn is ever idle the happy-go-lucky bumblebee which buzzes so near us on these warm summer days is always on the go although she is easy-going and happy-go-lucky mrs bumblebee is an an over-particular person as bee persons go she is not a careful housekeeper like her cousin mrs honeybee but she carries her own bundle just the same and probably is as contented in her roughly made untidy how as mrs honeybee is in her beautifully neat one sometimes she has a nest as big as your head with rooms in it of all sizes and shapes she probably thinks the honeybee family would get along just as well if they were a little less fussy and probably she is right early in the spring mrs bumblebee starts out house hunting when she finds the place she wants she puts some honey and pollen there and lays an egg on the little pie after a while the larvas come out of the eggs when they have eaten what they want they make a cocoon and curl up for a rest while they are being made into little workers you know the bee family is made up of the mother bee who is called the queen and many fathers who are called drones all the rest are workers that's something like the answer isn't it yes something jack but you mustn't tell that story yet every one of mrs bumblebee's first family are workers Why the first workers are out getting food for their brothers and sisters mrs bumblebee takes the old cocoons which they have left behind and makes them over into rooms for the new babies who are to be drones and queens they are very happy all summer long but as it grows colder they begin to shiver and shake at last all die except the young queens who have crawled away from the nest and found a warm crack somewhere in which to take a long nap when the spring comes the young queens rub their eyes stretch their legs and wings and are off looking for a home for their coming families but what kind of bee nest did old paul bear get into asked hope this nest was a wild honey bee nest some honey bees are wild with this way but mostly close to the homes of men when they live in our gardens they live in a hive we make for them and the families consist of mrs honeybee the queen about a hundred mr honeybees and many thousand of workers the workers are the little bees the drones the middle-sized ones and the queen is the great big bee men often help the workers to build the little cells in which they store the honey and in which the queen lays the eggs these cells are six-sided rooms every day the queen lays an egg in one of the little rooms and wish it the workers put some pollen and honey in three days out come the larva from the egg it is a helpless creature soft and white and without feet busy busy workers are always on hand to take the best care of the babies the first food the nurses give them is bee jelly which looks something like blanc marge the bee jelly the workers make in their stomach then feed it from their own mouths into the baby mouths after lunching a couple of days on bee jelly they are old enough to eat pollen and honey which the workers get out of the six-sided rooms where they have packed it away these babies grow very quickly soon they are so long that they almost fill their rooms then the nurses put in some extra food tuck in the babies and make a roof of wax over each room for a whole day the baby has to feed itself shut away all alone then it stops eating and lies very quietly while it is being made into a real bee in about thirteen days it split its dry skin in which it has been napping runs a hole in the wax roof and out it comes a full-fledged bee but it is too new and young to go out in the big world yet 
so for a few weeks it is kept busy in the hive nursing other baby bees when it has grown stronger it leaves the hive flying out over the sunny pastures in search of better cups and clever heads whenever the honey bees want to make a queen they know just how to do it you know a queen is a very important person a bee queen is like an ant queen not the ruler of a kingdom but the mother of many many children since a queen is a person of such note she must have a larger room than an ordinary worker so they set to work and tear down the partitions between two or three cells when the eggs in the large room hashes the white lava is fed bee jelly just like the little worker lava but it is never given any pollen or honey when it is five days old some jelly is put in the room with it and a roof is built over its head for seven long days the baby stay here all alone then it goes its way out and wonder of wonders we have a queen instead of a worker now mrs honeybee has been the queen of the family so long she is very angry to have a young queen hatch out and that's all she can to kill her but the workers have spent much time and labor in making this queen and they stand close around her to protect her from the jealous old queen the honeybee family however has grown so big that there is room for no new babies in the hive and that is the reason that the workers have raised the new queen so that she may start a new family there is no room in one house for two queens one must go and it is usually old mrs honeybee surrounded by part of the family she flies out of the old home in search of a new place if she is living in someone's garden a new hive is all ready for her and she soon settles down again to her egg laying while the workers hurry to bring in food for the new babies if there is no hive ready for this excited family it swarms in a tree or any other good place it happened to find yes said betty but do the workers have to work all the time they do everything except the egg laying all the pollen and honey must be brought into the hive by them have you ever seen the little baskets which working bees have for carrying pollen perhaps you do not know what pollen is well some day look right down in the center of a flower and you will find some fine yellow powder that is pollen or bee bread and the bee are very fond of it on the hind leg of the worker is a nice smooth place and on each side of it are stiff curved hairs which cover it over into this little cage the bees push the pollen then fly swiftly away toward the hive here this heavily leaden little fellow stands over one of the rooms and pushes the pollen off his hind legs by scraping with his middle legs you have eaten honey and know how thick and sweet it is very unlike the sweetened water in the flower cups isn't it the bees make this honey out of the watery nectar and i will tell you how to do it the bee sips this sweet nectar into its mouth then the nectar goes down a tiny tube into a little pouch called the honey sac this sac opens into the stomach but between the two are little lips which guard the entrance if the worker is hungry the little lips open and the nectar goes from the honey sac into the stomach but if it want to carry it back to the hive the lips stay tightly closed when the honey sac is full the worker flies back to the hive and empties it into one of the rooms then a number of bees stand with their heads bent downward and move their wings as fast as they can looking like miniature electric fans of course they grow very warm and it makes the hive warm this warm air evaporates the extra water in the nectar and soon the honey is all finished this bee which beat the air so tirelessly keep the hive fresh and sweet which is very necessary when so many bees live in one house the workers make the cells as well as fill them and now a very queer thing happens a great many bees eat a great deal of honey they eat all they can hold then crawl up to the top of the hive there are as many there as can find room the rest hang on to these until a curtain of bees is formed sometimes they hang quietly and patiently for several days until on the underside of the abdomen tiny shining plates of wax appear 
Other workers break off these pieces of wax and build them up into cells. You know how big a pound is, don't you? Well, just think how many, many times the bee must carry honey to the hives. When I tell you that 21 pound of honey will make but one pound of wax, bees are very economical with their wax. When they have to punch up holes and fill in cracks in their hives, they do it with a gum, which they scrape off sticky butts. Or some along these workers are laying in food to keep this large family during the cold weather. If for any reason the supply of food is low, the workers sting the babies to death rather than have them starve. Is it any wonder that these workers, who have so much to do and so many cares from morning until night, die very young? The queen may live for two or three years, but the workers do not live longer than six or eight weeks. Goodness me, said Jimmy. I wouldn't have believed there was any insect of the face of earth as clever as those be. If insects were all like that, I would want to know about every one of them. Can't you tell us something of the vabs? They must be clever fellows too. Not today, answered Benjo. It is getting toward noon and we must start home for dinner and to get our pottery cooked. Pick up the birds, Jack, and put them in your game bag. We must be off. End of chapter 14 Recording by Soro Shatawans in Surakun from Bangkok, Thailand Chapter 15 of Little Busybodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees and Other Busybodies this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Phillips. Speak Australian English at gmail.com. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marks. Chapter 15 Leaving Camp. At last the day had come, and the children were to leave camp in the clouds. They had been there for one whole glorious week of fishing, hunting, camping, picnicking, stories, and sleeping in tents. Betty and Jimmy felt rather sober, for the time for them to go back to the city was drawing near. A week now and their good times for the summer would be over. Already the leaves were turning a little, and the air growing crisper every day. Indeed, up in camp in the clouds, they had twice in the early morning to break the ice on the spring in order to get the water, and at night the blankets felt warm and cosy. Betty and Jimmy liked their city home, and after they were once in it, they enjoyed their schoolwork too. They had many friends, entertainments, parties and made many expeditions to the zoo and to the parks. But somehow, the happiest days of all the year came in the summer in Rangeley Village. Every hour seemed precious to them now, and the fingers on Betty's right hand, the number of days that were left, were all too few. Even Jimmy, who cared less for the country than Betty did, was sorry, and the children were sorry to have them go. All through the cold white winter in Rangeley Village, they were expecting the Reese children and the old guide. With their coming, good times began again, and this morning on which they were leaving camp, they felt rather blue, for although they expected to come back the next summer, as indeed they did, yet it seemed such a long, long time to wait. They followed Ben Guile single file down the mountain at a good pace, but without saying very much. By noon, they had reached the Dead River Ponds and were ready for luncheon. I think some of that birch, Tom, said Ben Gile, would make a good fire for us. Tom, who was a famous woodchopper in winter, went off towards the tree, followed by lazy little Peter, who loved to see others work. Soon the chips were flying right and left. Suddenly there was a yell from Peter. Tom dropped his axe. Ben Guile hurried over to the boy, and the others crowded around. Tom was sure a splinter had gone into Peter's eye. The lad was holding on to his eye and jumping up and down with pain. But as Ben Guile was trying to make the boy take his hand away, Tom exclaimed, 
grabbed one hand with the other and made for the pond. It's on its ben, he said, and before the others could say anything, he had clapped some mud onto his own hand and brought mud for Peter's eye, which he poulticed with this useful material and tied around it a big white handkerchief. Although Peter did not in the least like the bite, yet he felt rather proud of the bandage. And for the first time in his life, he too wanted to know about the creatures who could give so much pain. Tell us, sir, the children cried, about the wasps while dinner is cooking. So Ben Guile, who had left the cooking to the other guides, gathered the children and Mrs. Reese about him and began. One day, last fall, I saw high up in a tree near the pond the pretty grey nest of Mrs. Vespa Wasp. It did not look like a real house with windows in it and steps leading up to it, but there it hung, swinging in the bare branches, its walls of pretty soft grey blending so beautifully with the pale blue sky. I wondered whether any of the wasp family was at home, but the house was too high for me to reach, so I went away to find a long pole with which to knock. With my long pole I knocked gently at first, then louder and louder, but no one stirred within. So I poked harder, trying to break off a strong branch which ran straight through the top of the house. At last it broke off, and down came the grey house almost into my arms. It was big and round like a Japanese lantern. Guess of what it was made? Just paper. But not our kind of paper. It was wasp paper. Mrs. Vespa and her family make this paper out of wood pulp, which they get by scraping off the weathered wood from trees and fences. Of course, this old wood is of various colours, but that makes the house so much prettier. One wasp comes back with its burden of woody pulp rolled up in a little pellet. This it takes and spreads in thin ribbons along the edge of the wall which is being made. Perhaps this edge is dark grey. Then off it flies for more material, while another takes its place, with a pellet of light grey, which is soon skilfully moulded onto the edge. Sometimes the outer wall consists of several layers of this wasp paper, which is strong and waterproof. Within the wall are many stories of cone, built like different floors in our own houses. Early in the spring, Mrs. Vespa Wasp, who has been passing the cold winter days tucked away in a warm crevice somewhere, comes out and finds a site for her summer home. She begins this as a very small and simple one, starting with just a few rooms fastened to a branch of a tree. Here she lays an egg in each little room, then brings in food for the new baby wasps which are in the making. The kind of food which is stored away depends upon the kind of wasps. Some like beetles, some spiders, some caterpillars and others grasshoppers and cicadas. As in the bee family, the first children are all workers because Mrs. Vespa Wasp needs assistance in building up the home and feeding the children. This first home is small, not nearly large enough for the growing family so new rooms must be built at once. These are added on to the first ones until there is a good-sized layer of them. If Mrs. Wasp should go on making this upper story larger and larger, it would be buffeted about by the wind and rain, and perhaps broken. So the family starts a second story under the first. On the underside of the top floor, some of the cells are broken away, and a stem is made to start the next floor, and so on, until there are four or five combs in the house. They are always building the house over, tearing down the walls to make room for new floors. But this does not make the house unsafe in the meantime, as the walls are not connected with the floors, but form a loose envelope around them. Later in the season, after the family has become very large, some of the upper cells are torn out making a nice warm attic 
where the family may go to keep out of the wind and rain. They disliked the cold and wet very much. I carried this big house to my cabin with me, so that I might look it over and see just how it was arranged. Very carefully I cut away a little of the outer wall until I had a place large enough to look through. Guess what I saw lying cuddled down in many of these rooms? Little soft white baby wasps. When the Vesper family are grown up, they are called hornets. And Peter and Tom know how hornets sting. I was not afraid of the babies, but was not sure that all the old wasps were out. It was a cold day, and wasps get stiff very quickly. So I watched carefully to see whether the warm air of the room would not limber up some stiff joints, which were perhaps in hiding upstairs in the house. Sure enough, in a few moments out crawled a worker, looking quite dazed and sheepish at the change in temperature. I did not wait for it to become thoroughly awake, but picked it up with the forceps and put it out of the window. I was kept busy for twenty-five old fellows walked out thinking, no doubt, that they had made a mistake in the season, and that it was not time after all for them to die. All the wasp family, except the queens, expect to die, and do die in the autumn. I could not find either flies or spiders for the babies, and even if there had been a few about, I could not have used them, as there was no worker wasp to chew them soft and fine for them. So I made a nice appetizing syrup of sugar and water and found that young wasps were as eager for sweets as little children are. They worked their baby mouths busily as long as I had the patience to feed them. When the Vesper family are grown up, they eat honeydew from the little aphids, fruit juice and the nectar from flowers. Or, if fortune favours them, they may gain entrance to Mrs. Honeybee's home and feast from her well-filled honeycombs. But the babies all eat insects which their mothers put in the little rooms beside the eggs. Mrs. Polistus is a cousin of Mrs. Vespa. She is long and slender, while Mrs. Vespa is rather broad. Her house is a much simpler affair. It has just one layer of rooms suspended by a stem from the underside of a porch or maybe the eaves of a house. Are there solitary wasps? asked Jimmy. Just as there are solitary bees? Many wasps prefer to live alone rather than in a big house with hundreds of others. They are like bees in their cleverness, knowing how to tunnel in wood, dig deep pits in the ground or make nests of mud. Mr. Kellogg, a very wise man and young to be so wise, tells of one interesting little wasp called the thread-waisted sand digger, which lives in California in the salt marshes. These marshes are covered by plants, but in between are little smooth places covered with a glistening crust of salt. It is in these open spots that Mrs. Sand digger makes her home. She has strong jaws, and with these she cuts out a neat little circle of salty crust. Then she begins to dig a tunnel, humming away to herself all the time. After the hole is ready, she carefully backs out of it and puts a circular door on. Then she flies away to find food to store up for her children. These babies like tender green inchworms. So Mrs. Digger Wasp hunts around until she finds a fat one and then proceeds to paralyze it so that it will stay quietly in the house until the babies are ready to eat it for baby digger wasps are little cannibals preferring living caterpillars to any pre-digested spiders or flies. It is very wonderful that Mrs. Digger Wasp knows where to sting a caterpillar in order to paralyze it and yet not kill it. But she does. Perhaps you remember that insects have knots of nerve cells connected by nerve threads extending from one end of the body to the other? Jimmy remembers that I pinched him to illustrate this point. The knot on the top of the food tubes is the brain. Then underneath, there are usually three in the thorax, 
and several in the abdomen. Well, Mrs. Digger Wasp stings one or more of these little knots, which we call ganglia. That paralyzes the young inchworm so that it becomes limp and helpless, but still lives. Then Mrs. Wasp picks it up and carries it to her house and packs it in the bottom of the tunnel. After putting in five or ten, she lays an egg, fastening it on the body of one of the worms. She backs out of the tunnel and flies off to collect balls of dirt. With these, she fills up the tunnel completely. Carefully, she puts the little round door on. One day, someone saw her do a curious thing. She wished to be very sure that the door was fast shut. Perhaps it did not fit well. So, she found a tiny pebble, held it in her jaws, and hammered the door down with it. Wasn't that a clever thing for a wasp to do? The door closed. This is all the attention she gives to baby digger wasps. She has put in plenty of food, even for the hungriest larva. Now it must look out for itself, eat, grow fat and strong, and then dig its way out into the salt marsh. Mrs. Eumenes is a good-looking little wasp dressed in black and yellow. She is a mason making a pretty mud vase for a home. The clay or mud she moistens, then moulds it, little by little, into the vase which she fastens onto a twig. Some mud daubers make small cylinders placed side by side. Into these they put stung spiders. After tearing off their legs to make sure they will not recover and run away before the eggs hatch. Sometimes the mud daubers plaster up the keyholes in a house and so have snug homes. One day last summer, as I was sitting outside my cabin, I noticed a wasp carrying something green in its mouth. It came close to my head, then finally crawled up under the shingles on the side wall. All the afternoon it came and went, each time bringing something green. The next afternoon I was loading my guns and had put a hollow gun barrel on a table at my side. Soon I heard a whir of insect wings, and there, on the table, was my wasp friend. It walked up and down, examining very carefully the hollow barrel. Then cautiously it crawled in. In about five minutes it crawled out again and flew away. Soon it was back with a piece of green in its mouth. It crawled into the barrel and left the green. Six times the wasp did this. Then my curiosity became so great I could wait no longer. When she flew away, I tapped the barrel on the table and emptied out six little green worms, all limp and still. But Mrs. Wasp was back again, and I guiltily withdrew. She had brought the seventh worm, and when she saw the six lying on the table, she was much puzzled. She went around and poked each one to see whether it was limp, fearing, perhaps, that she had not stung them hard enough. But, finding them helpless, she picked them up one by one and patiently carried them back into the gun barrel. Three times I emptied them out, and three times she put them back, then flew away, never to return. I suppose the last time she went in, she laid the egg among the little worms, and then her duty done was off to find another good place to start a family. Have you ever seen a big cicada which makes the long, rasping sound in the trees? Some wasps like these very much for food. So, when Cicada sings, Mrs. Wasp swoops down on it, stings it, and then, big and clumsy as it is, carries it to her home for her children to feast upon. A Cicada is three or four times as large as a wasp, isn't it? asked Mrs. Reese. Yes, but there is nothing the wasps can't do, replied Ben Guile. I should think not, exclaimed Peter, who by this time was able to smile again. The trout are ready, Ben, said Adam, and everything else too, I guess. With the running and laughter, the children were soon about the fire, eating their last delicious out-of-door dinner. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of Little Busybodies 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett Phillips. Speak Australian English at gmail.com. Little Busybodies by Jeanette Augustus Marx. Chapter 16 Eyes and No Eyes. The evening party at Ben Giles' cabin was to be the last of all the beautiful summer. For the next day, Betty and Jimmy were to leave with their mother for the city. And this was the evening which was to decide who was to receive the prize. Betty had been working very hard for it and wanted it. But Jimmy couldn't see any use in lying with your nose on an anthill. As for Peter, he giggled whenever ants were mentioned to him and seemed not to care much one way or the other. Hope, however, was often with Betty, and the two girls, flat on the grass, tried to discover as many mysteries as they could about the busy little fellows. As for Jack, he was as busy as the ants, following them about, lying quietly for hours, and borrowing any book he could find that would tell about them. It seemed to him that if he could have that magnifying glass, that book of coloured plates, and the five-dollar gold piece, he would be the richest boy in all the world. He thought about it by night and by day, and he was certain that with the insect book and the glass, he should discover things nobody else in the world had ever seen. The poor boy was trembling with eagerness on this evening of the party at the guide's cabin. The children took their turn in telling what they knew. Peter giggled and said they seemed to lug a good deal of food. Jimmy said they ran in and out of their anthills very fast and knew how to build big hills. Hope was so frightened that when it came her turn, the child could not tell even the little she knew. But Betty, who loved everything in the out-of-door world, forgot herself and her fright in the true love which she had for natural history. She said she had spent hours in a neighbourhood of ants, near the doorways they had in the ground. Some of the doorways were large, and some were small, and the little ants who went in and out of the doors carried off the pieces of cake she fed to them. Sometimes the crumbs were three or four times as big as the ants. She had seen two little ants attack a large piece of cake, but it proved too much for them. So one mounted a guard over it, while the other scurried off. In a few moments it came back with a whole squad of ants, who surrounded the cake and pushed and pulled with all their might. They actually got it to the door, Betty said, and after that she could see it no more. Then Betty spoke a little wistfully. If only I had been an ant, I could have gone down after it. I could have seen what they did with it, sir. Well, my dear, said Ben Guile, if you want to see what they do, start a colony of them some day in a glass case. That will solve a good many of your problems. And now what else? I saw them doing a good deal that was interesting, sir, but I couldn't understand it. It's your turn, Jack. We will come back to Betty by and by. I found out, sir, that in every ant colony there are always three kinds of ants, the queens, the males, and the workers. It's much like what you told us of the bees. And it seems to me, sir, every time I looked at them, that they were happy together, busy with their work and never quarrelling with one another. I suppose they were happy because each one had some special work to do. I looked it all up in the books and I found that some are born queens to be waited on while others are born workers to do the serving. But they are all contented. The queen ant is not a real queen ruling a little kingdom. She is the mother ant and lays all the eggs. She is well cared for and protected by the workers. These are the active little ants who do all the work. 
they are happy too, running about, digging new passageways, clearing the paths to their front doors and bringing in food, which they store in their granaries. Some ants, sir, build their tunnels very deep underground. A doorway opens into a wide gallery from which others branch and wind their way down into the dark ground. Sometimes they build a high mound around the entrance and often a large colony will have many such mounds. Some ants, added Ben Guile, dig out their homes in dead logs or hollow stems. I know of one little fellow who is clever enough to build a shed. It hunts around to find decayed wood. This it chews into a fine pulp, then spreads it out into a roof. Sometimes it is a good-sized roof. This same ant dearly loves the honeydew which aphids secrete. So in order to protect these helpless little green bugs and make them as comfortable and as contented as possible, they build a neat shed over them. When the ants wish a dainty luncheon of honeydew, they crawl up under the little shed and get a drink of this sweet juice. Although a colony of ants lives together so peacefully, Jack, they are apt to be very quarrelsome with their neighbours. Often they go to war with another colony if the members of that colony happen to trespass on their grounds. I found out about some naughty lazy ants, sir. Instead of taking care of their own homes and hunting up their own food, they go out to war against another kind of ant, which is living quietly and attending to its own business. All the grown-up ants these little fighters either kill or frighten, so that they run away as fast and as far as their legs will carry them. Then these lazy ants steal the eggs and the babies. Some of them they eat on the way home. But most of them they carry to their underground galleries. There they take good care of them until they are grown up. Then these stolen babies become the slaves of the lazy ants. But the poor little slaves have never known any other life. So they cheerfully serve their masters doing everything for them. In fact, so long have these masters had little slaves to wait upon them that they do not know at all how to look out for themselves. They have been known to starve to death rather than to feed themselves. But there are many respectable ants, objected Ben Guile, and I will tell you how a well-regulated household behaves. One day last summer, when I was walking in the afternoon, I found myself suddenly surrounded by a cloud of winged insects, thousands and thousands of them. I caught one of them and found that it was a winged ant, for the males and queens have wings with which to fly away on their wedding journey. This journey lasts only a short time, and usually many colonies fly up together in the bright summer air. The wedding journey is a picnic for hungry birds. Just think of finding such a mass of juicy morsels at one time. They fly into the crowd and eat as many of the ants as they can, but many escape. At last they become exhausted. The males fall to the ground and die. The queens break off their wings because they never need them after the wedding journey. They look about for a good place to start a new home. The first thing the queen does is to lay her eggs in a neat little pile. These soon hatch out into larvae, tiny worm-like grubs without any legs. Queen ants feed their babies faithfully with nice tender insects, which they chew for them. Sometimes these larvae spin a tiny cocoon in which they lie quietly while they are being made over into ants, perhaps into a queen like the mother or a male like the father, perhaps into a worker, which is the mainstay of the whole colony. This first family of babies the queen mother must look out for herself, but just as soon as the baby workers are grown up, it is their turn to help her. The first set of workers are very small. From morning until night they are busy. Early in the morning they must go out for food to catch insects for the queen's breakfast and for the queen's baby ants. 
To be sure, it does not take long to prepare this meal, as it is chewed for the babies instead of cooked. Then the house must be set to rights. Extra grains of sand must be cleared out of the paths and galleries. Perhaps some careless little boy or girl may have stepped on the mound around the entrance and crushed it. The workers hurry to clear away the ruins and soon have a new mound neatly piled up. Tell us, Jack, what you know about these workers. Jack's face was bright with eagerness. Well, sir, in ant homes there are always babies. Lots of them, just as in other homes. These little larvae must be fed often and kept clean. The workers are the nurses, as well as housekeepers. If the babies happen to be in a cool, damp part of the house, they must be carried into a warmer, drier place. So the workers pick them up and take them out for an airing. Often they carry the little cocoons out into the warm sunshine or move them about from place to place. In some families of ants, there are some with very big heads and strong jaws. These are the soldiers. If there is any trouble in their village, these big-headed fellows go out as scouts or act as sentinels around the ant hill. But the head of the worker is rather small. It's a clever head, though, sir. On it are two antennae. Bent, sir, like sharp little elbows. You told us that ants talk with their antennae. These feelers are very sensitive. I watched two ants one day and saw them rubbing them together. I am sure, said Bengal, that some very exciting and interesting conversations are carried on by these fellows. Back of the head, continued Jack, is the thorax with the six legs. Then a very narrow piece joining the thorax and abdomen. I know of one ant, added the guide, who is nothing more or less than a honey jar. This honey ant hangs by its legs from the roof of its home. The little workers go out and visit the oak trees and hunt around for balls called oak galls. From these they get honey which they carry home and feed to the little fellows hanging on the ceiling by their heels. The honey is stored away in their crops. All day, these honey jar ants are fed, until the abdomens are as big as a currant, and the sweet yellow honey shines through the skin. When any of the family gets hungry, it crawls up to one of these fat little fellows and takes a refreshing sip. I know of another ant, began Jack, who could scarcely wait to begin, who lives in the home of a larger ant. This one builds small tunnels, connected with the large ones of the big ant, but is careful to make the doorways so small that the big ones cannot creep in and eat up the babies. When little ant gets hungry, it crawls up on big ant's back. Very gently, it strokes its head, then licks its cheek, until the mouth of Big Ant fairly waters. This is just what Little Ant intends the mouth shall do. It laps up the drop of sweetness, crawls down, climbs on the back of another Big Ant, and has a second luncheon. Sometimes little thief ants live in other ants' houses, stealing the food which the workers have been so busy collecting all the long day. By this time, the children were listening in open-eyed astonishment to Jack, who had absorbed so much of the spirit and the information of the old guide that he could talk almost as interestingly. Mother aphids, interrupted Ben Gile, who like corn very well, lay their eggs at the roots of the corn. But if the babies hatch out before the corn roots are ready, there is a family of ants who come to the rescue. They carry these babies over to some other roots, where they may feed until the corn roots grow. Later, they carry them carefully back again. Of course, they do not do this because they care for the welfare of the aphids, but because they know if the little corn lice have plenty to eat, they themselves will have plenty of honeydew, which they love. And there's a harvester, sir who builds a big mound around its front door and carefully clears away the grass. 
Into the long galleries of its home it carries a great many seeds and stores them away. All the chaff and hard parts which it cannot eat, it carries out again. Leading up to the big mound, added Ben Gile, are clear pathways as distinct as any path you or I make through the grassy fields. Perhaps ants are too little to do very much thinking, but they do many things which you and I would have to think about a long time before we should be able to do them. They have a good government which runs along without friction. They can build roads, dig tunnels, spin silken webs, build sheds, go to war, harvest grain into the storehouses, and keep a farm of aphids. By the time the old guide had finished, Betty was waving her hand the way she did in school. Please, sir, I don't know half as much as Jack does. He has told all I know and more, too. Ben Guile smiled at Betty, for he was very fond of her. He stroked his white beard and went on smiling as if he had some pleasant thought in the back of his head. Well, now, we must decide who has won the prize. Mrs. Reese, what do you think? Mrs. Reese was proud of her, Betty, and would rather have had her the generous little girl she was than have her win all the prizes in the world. I think Jack has abundantly earned the prize. And now, children, what do you think? Jack! they all shouted. Jack! said the guide, bringing forward three parcels. Here is the five dollar gold piece. This will help you buy what you need. Here is the book, which will help you identify what you see. And here is the magnifying glass. Remember, my boy, as you look through it, that it is God's work you are seeing. We have been through the old story of eyes and no eyes with you boys. Peter, I'm afraid, goes out and sees nothing. You, Jack, have used your eyes, and already you have learned much that ought to make you a wiser man. As you look through the glass, it is well to reflect that you will never see a cathedral window as beautiful as some wings you look upon from the clear lights of the cicada's wings to the gorgeous dyes of the moth. You will never see groin or arch or hinge more wonderful than the covers of a wing or the exquisite joint of some little insect. You may travel the world over before you can find, made by man's hand, such mystery and beauty as lie about you in the natural world. All the dynasties of Egypt could not shape the scale on a moth's wing. All the religion of the past can shape nothing that will do the Creator so much reverence as the world he has created, the world we have about us. There, my boy, that is a long sermon, but you will profit by it, for the world will hear of you yet. And now there's a little girl in this room who has worked faithfully to find out what she could. She is five years younger than you, Jack, and I want her to have something too. For a minute, Jack looked troubled. Then he said resolutely, Let me give her my book, sir. No, no, Jack, replied Ben Guile, pleased with the lad's generosity. I have an extra book here. Betty's face was beaming. Now let me write in your books, then to supper, around our last campfire for this summer. In a few minutes, the children were about the fire and there was the smell of roasting corn, the sizzle of broiling partridge tied around with bacon, and the fragrance of coffee for the older people. The firelight seemed particularly jolly. Betty was very happy with her book, nor would she be parted from it the next day on the train, and Jack was radiant. They ate and talked and sang about the campfire, thought Ben Guile the wisest man in the world, Mrs. Reese, the kindest of mothers, hoped that next year would come soon and wanted to know what stories they were to hear when the long winter was over. Perhaps it will be birds, said the guide. Perhaps fish, perhaps flowers. Maybe it will be spiders and crabs. Next summer is a long way off and now I have to go back to my school. In a short time, a line of lanterns was seen swinging and dancing up the hill of Rangeley. 
as the children filed homeward. The summer was over. End of chapter 16 End of Little Busybodies The Life of Crickets, Ants, Bees and Other Busybodies By Jeanette Augustus Marks